freedom free free freedom over fame free free freedom over f- f- cycle stays the same Hi, you're listening to Project Mankind Podcast. We are your hosts, Thomas. And I'm Jim. We're just a couple of guys who love Jesus, who are passionate in helping people find their purpose and helping them to align their purpose with the kingdom principles that Christ has laid down. As men, we often find ourselves struggling with the stresses of life, money, sex, relationship issues, past hurts, preventing us from becoming leaders God created us to be. We give practical advice in these areas through discipleship, as Jesus commanded in Matthew 28, and by sharing our own personal stories and testimonies. We invite you to join us in our conversations as we challenge ourselves to find higher ways to deal with our struggles and the courage to implement them. It's time to claim your freedoms and use the authority God has given us and learn to lead like a lion and reign like our king. All right, welcome back to Project Mankind. Uh, This is your host, Thomas. And this is Jim. We're glad you're with us today. All right. So Today is a new topic. We're talking about this time, the price paid for our sins. I think we had discussed in the past that we have consequences of our sins. We have forgiveness that's required for those sins. And then we also have sins of the Father, which we talked about in regards to some things that we have no control over, something that someone else had done, but somehow we're affected by it, right? So Jim, on the regards of the sin you know, there is a price for it. And we know it. Paul had wrote this that says that, you know, the wages of sin is death. Right. But then John wrote something a little bit different in, in 1 John five sixteen when he talked about that not all sins lead to death. So it's not necessarily, you know, a contradiction of each other, but we can elaborate on that, on what Paul wrote versus what John wrote, if you don't mind, um, just so that we can have a little bit more clarity as to why Paul actually wrote that the wages of sin is death, because it's very important that we understand that there's a price for this, right? Right. And so, yeah, the thing is, any sin is a sin that I take it as a sin that leads to death. In the spiritual sense, we we die because of our sins. And that, that's been true since the fall of man, Genesis 2, as it comes yes, through in the, in the uh, Old Testament. And it when we sin, it really is a transgression against the plan of God, the law of God, the will of God, but also it's a transgression against the character of God, against the nature of God. God is perfect, and in Him there is no sin. But we have been put in a position where all humans sin at one time or another, and it's a part of our humanness. But the thing is, God had ordained that sin is going to lead to death. So, his whole Old Testament, his Jewish, the Jewish, the Hebrew economy was about that coming of Christ and the Christian economy, if you want to look at it that way, plan that God had was about that. And so the idea is how do we escape that death? You know, if if I sin and I die in my sins on earth, I'm going to die in my sins in hell and apart from God. And I don't think we have any idea the horror of that. Yeah. I don't think we can even imagine anything about it. And so I want to make sure that I don't allow myself to continue in my sin. As soon as I recognize it, I want to do something about it. And the scriptures give us the answer to that. Uh, Usually it involves sacrifice of some kind. In the Old Testament, there were sacrifices of animals that God accepted in place of the life of the sinner. Technically, the sinner should die, but God provided a way out of that by accepting an animal. The sinner would place his hand on the animal's head and he would kill the animal and the body of the animal would be offered as a sacrifice to God in place of the sinner. And so uh, not to go all into it that particularly right now, but but that's the thing. All sin leads to, to death, separation from God at the end. And even more than that, a, a kind of eternal punishment that the Bible does talk about that is horrible and in its own way. God has given us a way out of that that involves sacrifice. In the Old Testament, a sacrifice of animals that pointed the way to Christ. And then in the New Testament, the final sacrifice, who is Christ Jesus himself, so that there need be no more sacrifices. And we look to him Absolutely. as our salvation. So Yeah. So we're referencing the Bible in Genesis that basically when Jesus had told Adam and Eve that if you eat off of this fruit, you will surely die. And that statement, now we both know that they didn't die, right? But you also physically, mentioned yeah. physically, physically, <laughs> right, they didn't physically right. die, but, right. but spiritually they died. So that, yes. that part of that has to be clarified because there are some things that we choose to do that can lead to physical death. Right. But 
the sin in itself leads to spiritual death. This is separation from God, right? right. So right. a lot of these things that people may be confused about is that what happens to us if we are a sinner and we were not forgiven or we did not ask for forgiveness. So I mean, we're going to be thrown in hell, you know, we're going to be burned for the rest of our lives, you know, all these images in our head, because a lot of yeah. the old churches used to preach about you know, brimstone and fire and, uh, right. you know, all the bad God that the father that is, that is just really punishing us. But we're talking about spiritual separation here in right. ourselves, in our, in our spirit, being separated away from God is punishment in itself. Right. And, you know, uh, going back to the predicament of Adam and Eve in the garden, we see irony after irony, because the serpent told them, he mocked God really. And he said, uh, <laughs> as God said, you can't do this. Yes. Uh, and he, he posed questions. He questioned God's character and authority. And, and he said, you know, God knows that if you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. <laughs> you'll have all, you'll have knowledge and you'll understand so much more and you'll be thinking like God and behaving like God. You'll become a God. And so the funny thing, I say funny, ironically, not really funny, but the interesting thing is that when they ate from that tree, they ate the fruit of the tree, their eyes were open. Absolutely. And they did have a lot more knowledge and understanding. But the ironic thing is, that they actually became, in, in a way, their spirits withered in that experience. Right. They were like God only in the fact that they had now an awareness of good and evil. They had an awareness of some things that they hadn't been aware of before, but it didn't help them. What God said was going to happen did happen. You will die. And so they died in the fact that their spirits were cut off from him. Yes. And that was a, a more lethal death than even a physical one would have been at that time, probably for them in a sense, you know, uh, because they used to they used to spend time all the time, spend time with God. Walk, God walked in the garden with, with them. However that happened back then, I don't know what, what that was like, but I know that his spirit was with them and their communion was beautiful. Their fellowship was great. And, and, and complete. And then all of a sudden, wow, they were just cut off. From them. Right. And so all the goodness that they'd experienced before turned into badness. And that's what sin does. It corrupts. It turns, all, it turns all the light into darkness. And so God was able, in a sense, he caused them to go ahead and live by killing some animals for them. No animal had ever died before that, of course. And he killed animals and made clothes out of skins of those animals. And their whole world changed. Their whole life changed and their whole world changed. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be the cause of the death of a living thing at that right. time? It was you, you did this. Yeah. No death had ever happened. There had been no death before that time. And all of a sudden, because of what I do, this dark, horrible apparition of death is brought into the world. Wow. That's, that'd be tough to live with. You know? Absolutely. And, and you know, when God killed the animal, mm -hmm. he clothed them with the same skin that came from the animal that was sacrificed. That's, that's right. right. And that was something that's very symbolic as well, because it kind of almost made you wear that sin on yeah, you. Right, right. Wear your sin. Yep, yeah. yeah. So and it, it's constant it's, awareness. Definitely. Yeah. It's constant awareness. But God showed his mercy from the beginning and it showed Adam and Eve that, look, I have to do this in order for you to have a relationship with me. In order for you to live, I have to kill something. Yes. Right? Yes. And so because they're apart from the shedding of blood, there's no permission of sins. You know? Absolutely. He was tells us that for sin to be done away with, somebody has to die. Absolutely. The, the sinner can die eternally. Or it, and it sounds so can, it sounds so harsh when you talk about death death and sin. And so why mm -hmm. is it that death has to be the ultimate price for a sin? Now we can probably sit here and, and say, what is so, what's a, what's the big deal about eating a fruit, right? What is the big deal about it? But there were some circumstances in there that God told them what not to do and right. also told them what's available for them, right? He, he just gave them one thing. He says, just don't eat off of this yeah. tree, right? Right, right? But because of our free will, God could not do anything to stop us, right? There was nothing that he can do. I mean, he could magically destroy the tree and never right. have it exist. But if not, we would just be robots doing exactly what God tells us. But God does not want that kind of relationship. He wants us to freely choose him Right. over anything. Yes, that, that's really true. And that's a good point. You know, I, uh, God isn't interested in emotionless robots to do his will. Absolutely. Uh, he could have done that if he wanted to, but what he wanted was living, breathing people who would be in a sense like him as much as a human can be like him, have not just a body and you know emotions and, and things that just 
things that are that are human, but he wanted us to have a spirit, a soul that would engage him and who would love him and want to do what he wants us to do. Absolutely. Not someone who would rebel and do the opposite, you know, of what he asked. Exactly. And I know that, you know, it sounded harsh as well when God banished him, you know, Genesis 323, they were banished from the Garden of Eden. And it was mostly like banished from the presence of God at that time. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gives mm -hmm. us an image of what it feels like when you commit a sin and how you have to be separated away from God, away from the wow. presence of God, because Eden is not really a location, right? We know that Eden is more of a presence of the Lord where he's at, wherever he dwells, that's Eden. Mm -hmm. So wherever God is, that's Eden for us. Many times our sins cause us to separate away from that Eden and it makes things very horrible for us. You know, going back into the Bible when Abraham had agreed, this was prior to them having Isaac. Abraham agreed to the proposal of his wife, Sarah, to have a child with her servant. Right. right? And just like Adam, he could have easily said, let me consult with God first. <laughs> yeah. I'm the man of the house here. Let me, yeah. let me ask the Lord, because we know that Abraham is a friend of God, and a friend of God can easily talk to God at any time. And we know the closeness of Adam with God was so close that, that even before they sinned, God was dwelling amongst them. They, he was mm -hmm. walking around. Right. So Abraham could have easily consulted with God and said, you know what, Lord, you promised me that I'm going to have a son, but my wife is proposing this to me. What do you think about it? But he never really went that way, right? <laughs> he just said, you know what, no. that sounds like a great idea. Let's go for it. That created such a havoc in that household that we know today the battle between the land and Israel is still going on because of that decision. Never ended. Never, Never ended. ended. Exactly. And it, I, I'm not trying to get political here, but it started from that decision, you know, but God yeah. kept his promise with him. God gave him Ishmael regardless and chose the line where Ishmael, uh, Isaac is, not Ishmael, but Isaac is. Mm -hmm. But he didn't leave Ishmael behind because he understand that the decision was already made. So they were still given some land. But in, in, in regards to that, it, the decision that, that Abraham made uh, caused division and it caused division amongst his own family. So Yeah, it sure did. And you know, in light of what we talked about in our last segment when we got together to talk about the, the fruit of sin, if, if you know, sins of the father, way, yeah, but, yeah, the sins of the father and the uh, the fallout from all that, we see that in in the history, the uh, the generations of Isaac and Ishmael. You know, there is this constant warfare between those peoples, those people groups, that it came from the sin of Abraham. You know, Abram, and so it really illustrates what we were talking about before that there. Out of sin comes confusion and, in a, in a sense, a kind of judgment, punishment, you know, that people experience even multiple generations on down the line. Absolutely. You know? And um, so that's a good illustration of that, I think. Yeah. I mean, there's consequences in our decisions. And we talked about that in our last episode, we talked about the father sin, but the sin in itself has a price to pay. And so we're talking about now, what is it? that has to be paid in order for us to get that sin removed from us because we don't want to be eternally separated from God. And we don't want to constantly right. make that mistake without an exit. So mm -hmm. God provided an exit. And I think this goes back yep. in the beginning in Genesis. And also we saw that when Abraham was getting ready to sacrifice Isaac. I think that was another depiction of a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And so through Abraham's faith, of course, because he's the father of faith, you know, he's like the godfather of faith. Um, he said that, you know, God will provide the sacrifice. So he right. understands that God is going to provide the sacrifice, that he will not just take Isaac from him, which is the promise, and be sacrificed that day. So I wanted to kind of show that, that there's always a sacrifice for what we've done. And God has shown this to us, that there's going to have to be a price paid for this. So Jim, let's talk about what is the price to pay for the sins of mankind. Well, let me begin by going back to Numbers. Can I do that? Yeah, let's do it. Because there was an incident that took place when the people of Israel were on their way to the promised land, the land God had promised them. It's an interesting thing, and it tells us that God made a provision. It was not particularly a sacrifice, but it was. It pointed the way to Christ as a future sacrifice. And I wanted to talk about that because forgiveness of sins always comes through blood. It's clear, mm. and it seems gory, and 
it is. It's really gory and horrible. But I want to go back to this incident when the people were, were sinning in the sense of they were talking to God, they were demeaning God and his provision. It says the people traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread. There's no water. And we detest this miserable food that mm. God has given us. And then the Lord does something really interesting. The Lord sends venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. Now, that would be a pretty horrible thing. You know, I looked this up. So I looked up how many poisonous species of poisonous snakes are in Israel. Wow. So right now, depending on who you talk to, there are either nine or 10 poison snakes and they're pit vipers. And there's one that's a different uh, venom and that's covert. Okay? okay. And so, but they have numerous poison snakes. God uh, could have chosen numerous ones to send among the people, but people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. And let me just say, this goes back to the idea of hating God. They expressed their, really in a sense, their hatred of God by demeaning him and demeaning the provision that he had made. So that was that was a part of what they were doing. But he, he said, that, pray to Moses. They said, pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And here's what the Lord said to Moses. He said, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze or perhaps a copper snake and put it up on the pole. Wow. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake lived. And so God made a miraculous kind of provision for them. He didn't just say, okay, you, you confessed, you repented, you're healed. He did something kind of extraordinary. In fact, you know, I don't know how many people died. The text doesn't say maybe thousands. I don't know. Right. The idea is that they were so freaked out, if you want to put it that way, that they all might die, that they finally, they turned, they asked Moses to pray to God for them. All of a sudden they're repentant. And they need a way out. And, you know, God didn't just say, well, too bad. You blew it. So you're dead. He, um, he gives them a way out. And he, and so Moses makes this, uh, this bronze or this copper snake and puts it on a pole. And so anyone who looked at the snake, who gazed at the snake, who lifted up his head, you know, and gazed at the snake on the pole would live. And wow. so that was God's provision for them to get out of that. And that sounds like a kind of a weird story. And maybe it is, but it does show the love of God for these people. He didn't want them to die. You know, Christ mentions this very same story in one of the early encounters that he has. He encounters in a really famous conversation, a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Hmm. Nicodemus was coming to Christ to inquire, ask some things about him because Jesus had been performing miracles and had been speaking truth of God in a way that people had never heard the truth. So Nicodemus comes, he wants to find out about that. Nicodemus is, is wondering about how a person becomes saved or born again, or comes into the kingdom of God. Enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes. It, it, yes. Or the kingdom of God. Yeah. And so that, well, the kingdom of God may be seen as the kingdom on earth, kingdom of heaven, heaven. Sometimes a semantic difference, but Jesus says, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Then he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, which is that yeah. text we just read. So the son of man, that is he, Jesus Christ, son of man, the son of God must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Wow. And so Jesus is using that Numbers 21 passage and what God did back then, that actually was a sort of type of Christ. It was, it was a, an Old Testament look at Jesus the Messiah as the snake was lifted up on the pole and whoever looked up at it, at it was, was saved. So in a salvation sense, Jesus would be lifted up on a pole on the cross. Yeah. And those who look to him for their salvation will be saved. In other words, Everyone who believes in him, those may have eternal life. It's amazing so that conversation with Nicodemus, because that's the very first time. Now, I know that there's churches built on born again. This conversation happened between Jesus and Nicodemus at right. probably like two o'clock in the morning. So it, oh, yeah. this, is, this is not something that Jesus talked to his disciples about. So for us to kind of take the whole born again thing and create a whole denomination out of it, to me, um, you know, that's here, near, or there. But what I'm saying is, this is a conversation because 
Nicodemus had to hear this from Jesus. He had to understand because Nicodemus is the Pharisees of Pharisees. He's the high priest. He's he's one of the top, let's just say top priests in Israel. So he has all the knowledge of the book. He has all the knowledge of the book of Moses. He knows the book in and out. He was a teacher of all teachers. That's what the Bible described him as. Yeah. And so the conversation that him and Jesus was having he saw Jesus performing all these miracles. He saw him. He followed him. You know, there was documents about his whereabouts and the things that he has done. And a lot of it was pointing back into the Old Testament. Yes. Right? Yes. So it made him very curious. I said, could this be what was the prophet had written about? So in yep. his mind, he wanted to know. So this conversation about him and Nicodemus was very important because Jesus brought the exact same First, you just talked about with, yeah. the, with the serpent, right? Because you said earlier that the sin is in the blood. And so the sin entered through man and it's in our blood and that's how it's passed on. So in order, Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus that in mm. order for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again, meaning you must be born outside of the bloodline that you're in because the bloodline that you're in is sinful. Yeah. You must be yeah. born again. And that's something that no one can understand. And his his response was kind of, I guess, kind of funny because he said, what do you mean? I'm, you know, this, I'm old. Like, how am I going to be born again? Right. But he didn't understand yeah. what Jesus was talking about. He's saying that the vibe or the snake kind of depicts the poison that was in that snake. Anyone who gets bit by it will die, will surely die. It's kind of like that sin that enters into your bloodstream because that's how poison enters into our bodies. It goes in there, it coagulates your blood and it poisons the rest of your body. And essentially it stops your heart and your organs. Mm -hmm. But what Jesus is saying is that in order for you, you got to be washed. You got to be cleansed. You got to be born like a baby. And that's yeah. something that we have to understand that in order for us to get out of this situation, we need Jesus. We need that filter. We need that blood cleanser. We need to be born again. And we need right. to understand that this is the only way that we can enter the kingdom. And there's no other way, right? He mentioned different ways to different people on how to enter the kingdom. But this is one way that he made Nicodemus or tried to make Nicodemus understand what he's asking about. He understands right. the knowledge of right. Nicodemus. You know, when he talks to people, when Jesus talks to people, he, he talks to your level. He talks your language, doesn't he? He talks your language. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> yeah. does. He makes you think, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, see, Nicodemus had memorized that Numbers 21 passage. A guy like him, he would have memorized the whole Testament. Whole, whole Testament. And they had ways of doing that, that that we don't know about because that's just a different culture, but they, he had memorized all that stuff. He knew that he knew the law backwards and forwards Absolutely. and he was a good man. He did his best to keep the law all the time. And so his concept of salvation was tied up in keeping the law and making sacrifices, right? That was for him kind of a salvation thing, but Jesus just turned that all upside down. He, <laughs> when he referred to the serpent, you know, the, the, the snake, snake was lifted up. Nicodemus knew exactly what he was talking about. And when he said, so must the son of man be lifted up. Absolutely. I doubt if Nicodemus knew that Jesus was going to be crucified at that time, but that's what Jesus was talking about. And then when Jesus told him that his salvation rested on belief in him, that was such a, a mind blower, you know, to uh, Nicodemus. And you're right. Uh, when he was talking about, it, he said, do I have to crawl into my mother's womb and be actually born again? I don't understand that. And Jesus said, no, you don't get it. It's not about that. It's about regeneration and a washing by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're talking about. And that happens through belief. Absolutely. I want to read a passage here in John 2. It says that, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And now the importance of this passage is that the Jews have been promised to be taken out of oppression. And so the promises in the Old Testament was for the Jews. And so now we're entering into the New Testament, and John is writing about one man who sacrificed for the entire world. This includes their enemies. This includes the Romans who had oppressed them, include anyone. That's hard for people to understand that the one person, one person's blood must will carry everyone's sin in him and it, it will wash it away. I personally, I don't want to see my enemy be saved, but Jesus is saying, when I come, I'm coming for everybody, not right. just for you guys. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Nicodemus apparently understood that. I'm not sure exactly when that transition for him took place, but 
Later on, he was one of two men who asked for Jesus' body, and they went and prepared it. They were given the body of Christ to prepare and place in the tomb. So we know that Nicodemus was a believer and that it probably happened. At least it happened through that encounter with Christ that night. Yeah, And that's a remarkable thing. A, a man like Nicodemus, you can understand how hard it would have been for him to, to, to conceive the truth that Jesus was trying to get across. And yet eventually he did. And, and that's just an amazing thing. We're happy we'll see him in heaven. Absolutely. I mean, you, you know, it's just, it's not just that one time, but, you know, it, but Jesus really did not reveal what was going to happen to him because he was not allowed to to say exactly what's going to happen. He's giving us signs. He gave us signs that we just we just can't see it, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people they don't really understand how to imagine someone is going to die for their sin. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not until later that the disciples had to kind of have a first hand look at this on how someone sacrificed themselves. You know, John, I call him the author of love because everything he writes mm-hmm. is about love. He's so I mean, he you know he call he calls himself the one that Jesus loved. That's self appointed, by the way. He, you know, he called himself the one whom Jesus loved. But I think that's how he felt. He felt so loved by God. He, he felt so loved by, by Jesus Christ that he writes about it all the time. You know, he's the one that wrote John 3.16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we know that. I think a lot of people can memorize that verse and recite that verse by memory, just like our father who art in heaven. But just to actually see it, and to believe it as a Jew, that was a hard thing. Yes, yes. You know, because yes. they're, a, they're a monotheistic culture where they only pray to one God and right. they don't want anyone claiming to be God. And now someone is claiming to be God and to be the mm-hmm. sacrifice for God, the ultimate sacrifice yeah. and the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And he didn't come the way they thought he was coming, mm-hmm. you know, and this was a, a surprise to them. Yeah, you know, they really expected their Messiah when he would overthrow Rome and he would set the his people free, that he would ride into Jerusalem on a stallion with soldiers with him to destroy the Romans. And here he comes riding into Jerusalem on a baby donkey. <laughs> and you think, you know, Jesus is just the you most. You got to love God's person. sense of humor, right? Oh, I know, right? Absolutely. And uh, they're, they're got, they got to be thinking, is it now, Lord? Is it now? Is it now you're going to bring your army and you're going to overthrow everything? Here he comes in on a baby donkey, you know? And they eventually got the picture. It was late, they, late in the, in the life of Christ with them that finally came to understand that this wasn't the time when he was going to overthrow anything except sin itself. And judgment, and that he didn't come as a conquering king. He would come as a suffering servant, throughout fulfilling Isaiah 53. That was the work that he was to do at that point. And so, you know, he kind of fulfilled all those things that he talked about with Isaac, with uh, Nicodemus at that time. And he was actually doing the work through his crucifixion and then in his resurrection that he had talked about. But totally. nobody understood it until the very end. In fact, they weren't even sure they saw him after his resurrection. They weren't even sure that it had happened. You know, absolutely. So, now, yeah. we know that the sacrifice for the sin is death, and we know that Jesus Christ became the sacrifice for this. And But what we want to understand is that the sacrifice that had to be made in order for us to be back in relationship with God has to happen. And so the Bible described it that there was a conversation that happened, that Jesus basically volunteered to be the sacrifice for us. Now, in throughout the whole New Testament, it, it showed that Jesus kept going to God, asking God if there's any other way, if there's any other way, right? So you could see that, and I want to bring this out there because I know a lot of people and many Christians believe that Jesus Christ died for you and me. And I absolutely believe that 100%. But also, Jesus Christ died for his father. I absolutely believe that as well. I think that his obedience to his father, Father God, is what another thing that we didn't account for because he's he continues to describe to us some things that John even wrote about that the way to show love is to lay down your life for somebody else. That has to come from somebody and that came from the father. And so he's doing what the father has asked him to do. Now, he knows that he's doing it for us because the father wants this to happen, right? right. There has to be a sacrifice. It was either going to be us or it's going to be him. And Jesus said, I'll do it, right? He's the advocate. He said, I'll do it. I'll take their place, father, mm-hmm. right? But so yep. I wanted to bring that out there so that people are just not saying, oh, Jesus died for me. Yes, he did. He died for you. Absolutely. So that you can have right standing with God one more time and you can have a conversation with the Lord and have your repentance and your confession. But Jesus did something absolutely that no one even talked about is that 
he obeyed. He obeyed his father. Right. What you're talking about, this is really important. I mean, the truth is that Jesus would have died for you if you were the only person on earth. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the portion of scripture that talks about his prayer in the garden before his, just before his death, I mean, that's a, that is such a hugely emotional thing. I mean, the truth is that in his heart of hearts, he didn't want to. And yet there was this other part of him that did want to because he wanted to fulfill the Father's will. He said, let this cup pass from me, the cup of the cross itself and eternal death. See, Jesus had to die eternally. He had to be separated from the Father. Mm. He had to, in a sense, go to hell and be separated from yeah. God so that we didn't have to be. Wow. If that hadn't happened to him, we could never be saved. Absolutely. But it did happen to him. You know, he was saying, I let this pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he was after that willing to accept whatever God had for him. And it was a, it was a horrible, painful, torturous death. Yeah. I, you know, we've seen a lot of movies about the death of Jesus Christ. Passion of the Christ is probably one of the most gruesome one, but we don't really understand the torture that Jesus had went through for us. You know. I mean, the Romans were, they were the expert torturers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they invented torture. And, and he wasn't clothed. He didn't have this nice little lay on him when he was on the mm -hmm. cross. He was naked. He was naked on the yeah. cross. Everything was ripped from him. You know, everything was hanging out. You know, his genital, genitals are, are hanging out. His, his, his whole ribs are, are hanging out. Everything was hanging out. People didn't really, cannot really see that. But the disciples saw that. His mother saw that. The people saw that even to the end, right? You can see how much punishment he had to take for us. Right. The thing about it is, I didn't realize this for a long time, but as, as horrible as all that was, and by the way, we have well-documented information about what Roman crucifixion was like. Mm. I've done lectures on it before and stuff, and it is just really the, a horrible way to die. And you're right about nakedness and the shame of that being a part of the torture that a person would go through. But the thing is, I didn't realize for a long time that was not the biggest thing. Mm. The biggest thing was the fact that God in, G in the death of Christ, in that in, at that time, God had to condemn his own son yes. and to pour into him all of the wrath of an angry God wow. for the sake of the people of this world throughout the ages. Wow. And that's, I don't think we can understand that exactly, but that's what God was doing when his son was on the cross. Yeah. He was hating his son wow. and pouring wrath into him. And you talk about agony. That's so much more agony producing, I would think, than, than the cross. I, I as think bad the, as that is. the statement of Jesus when he was on the cross, it says, why have you forsaken me? Is mm -hmm. that moment in time where God have to turn away from him and basically like you said blame him for all of our sins and pour it onto him at that moment right. now that's right now that's right. we have to understand why that is so short because and why is it so short but it's so painful is that imagine this imagine that you and your twin brother never separated in your entire life and that one moment you guys were separated just that one moment you guys finish each other's sentences you guys walk wherever one the other person walk you wear the same clothes you wear the same hats you wore the same shirts you wore the you wore same you wore the same everything but then that one moment somebody pulled you away and you were temporarily separated from your twin brother when jesus talks about his father talk about father god abba yahweh he talks yeah. about him and father being one when you see me you see the father right no one has seen the father except me that's how close he was to G to god jesus was that close to god and for that moment father god had to turn his face away from him yes yes and and, and i think that a lot of christians don't understand that turning away of the father is a rejection that jesus christ never felt before right never before yeah. he knew it was coming though. Yeah. Exactly. And he asked God, is there another way? Hey. Basically, Father, is there another way? And Father said, no, nope, that's the only way. There's no other way. And so he said, then let's do it. You know, that quote, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me is one of the seven statements of Christ on the cross. It really is a reference that he's referencing Psalm 22 at that point, oh. where David writes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me and from saving me so far from the words of my groaning? And then later in that same Psalm, David actually predicts 
It's a prophecy of Christ's crucifixion. And here's what he says. He says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint, which is what happens in in crucifixion. Uh, My heart has turned to wax. It's melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, none of Jesus' bones were broken on the cross. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Wow. How would David know that? How did David know that that was going to happen to Christ? Those very things that he mentioned would happen. Wow. Well, he might not have known about Jesus per se, but he knew about the saving power of God. And the Spirit of God wrote this through him. Yes. And absolutely. a lot of those people who were at the cross, at the foot of the cross, would have known where that was. And some pe- I've heard some people say, this was Jesus basically saying, go back and read Psalm 22, and you'll know what this is all about. Right, right. And that was a prophecy, actually. That was a prophecy yes. that David yes, wrote was. there. Yes, you know? it was. Yeah. So, absolutely. So, Jim, you know, in this segment, we, we want to give people an opportunity to get back on that cross. People understand that this is the only way. This is the mm-hmm. only way. There is no other way. You can write letters. You can leave voicemails, send an email, ask for forgiveness. But the only way to wash it all away is to look up, acknowledge the cross, acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord right. and your Savior and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Yeah. Right? That is the only way. Mm-hmm. Do you see any other way? I, I don't see any other way here. There's no other way. Yeah. There's no other way. Absolutely. So if, if it's something that people need to do, I mean, it's it sounds so simple, but a lot of people don't do it. A lot of people don't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I, I accept you. I, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to take over my decisions. But it's so hard for them to do that. You know, what is that causing that separation there? What is causing that that one thing that not that's not allowing people to 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 get past that, you know, for and, and continue on with what they're doing? Right. You know? I mean, Jesus kind of sums it up in John 1 12. Yeah. Um, he says, yet yeah, to all who received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So it really has to do with placing our belief in Christ to forgive our sins, and to connect us to the Father Absolutely. through His death and resurrection. You know, that, that's the thing. Belief, trust, faith. In the Greek text, they're all the same word. It's an interesting <laughs> thing. Interesting. So if I believe, if I have trust in, if I have faith in, they're all the same thing. I cast my whatever, whichever one of those you want to use, but it, that's what it takes. Believing in Christ to die for my sins, raise from the dead, and connect me to the Father through that death experience of His. Right. And when I believe in Jesus, you know, then then I am saved. I am born again. That's what He was talking. That's what He was telling Nicodemus. Yes. And when that happens, and there's a heart belief in Christ and His work for me in my soul, in my heart, whatever you want to call that. And I, that's, and it's a true belief that I'm connected to the father in a new way. And Jesus calls it being born again. And whatever you want to call it, I guess it doesn't really matter what you call it, but that experience is what assures me of heaven to come and being with God forever. Absolutely. There's, there's a sacrifice on our part though. I want to make sure that we also bring that out there. There is a sacrifice on our part in order for us to take this acceptance because, you know, Jesus is pretty clear that, you know, to follow him will be persecuted as well. Uh, We will be mocked as well. We'll be separated from this world. So Mm -hmm. one of the statements that Matthew wrote down, is says, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. This was Mm -hmm. documented. Jesus wrote this. uh, Jesus spoke this and Matthew Mm -hmm. wrote it. He was talking about the fact that we have to give up our life in order for us to be with him. Basically, it's like a life and in life in exchange. Basically, said, I'll give you my life. For your life and right. what a great exchange but a lot of people don't want to exchange that they want to keep their life and then as for jesus as well right i mean you can't do that and i think there was a story about a rich young man who came up to jesus how can i enter the kingdom of heaven and he said you know you have to give up all your possessions and then the young man walked away because it says the man had a lot of possessions yeah yeah. Right. So he wanted to show Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus, I think if, if we look back in the Bible, he wasn't being mean to the young man. He was just basically telling him what's in his heart. Yeah. He was showing him his heart's condition. His heart's condition. Exactly. Yep. So for us, yep. in order for us to accept the salvation, we have to open up our hearts. And I, I like the 
one of the statements that Jesus made. What we call in the collection of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 mm. is those who have a pure heart will see God. Ah. And, and I love that because we have to have that cleansing in us. And it, ha- it starts from Jesus. It starts from accepting Jesus. But at the same time, it also comes with us giving up what we have, giving up our old ways, our ourselves, our sins, because we have to have that exchange in order for God to enter into us. You know, it's not just as saying it, we also have to do it, right? It- well, that's, that's, that's all tied up in the belief. You know, once my, once I believe that's the only real condition on salvation is belief. Right. And so, but along with true belief, if it's real, if it's saving faith, then my heart undergoes a transformation, right, Thomas? And, Absolutely. and so all of a sudden, I want to be a really good man. I want to do the right thing. My conscience is awakened. And uh, it's awakened not just to right and wrong. It's awakened to Christ. It's awakened to God. It's awakened to a greater thing than I've ever lived before. And so my, I, 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 rather than fighting and kicking against what I think is <laughs> the, what I should, the right thing to do, right? right now, I want to do the right thing. And it's because of the transforming work of Christ in my heart that that's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I I love that. I mean, definitely wanted to make sure that we clarify that for everybody. Um, You know, the beauty of the fact that we have this cross and just like the Israelites were given the same cross, it says anybody who looked at this cross, you will be saved. You will not die. Right. Now, God gave us the same cross, but this time he's giving us the ultimate cross. He's saying, anyone who look to this cross, anyone who give their life to this cross, anyone who follows this cross will not die. You will live eternally, right? So now the wages of sin is death, but that death was already given. That death was already been provided. And Jesus Christ had already done that for us. So we don't have to die. Right. right? And so the, the next part of that passage uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through That's Jesus right. Christ, our Lord. That's and right. so that shows the whole picture. That's you right. Know? That's so, right. Yeah. That's right. I yep. love it. Absolutely. So let us invite our brothers and sisters who are listening right now, who is maybe contemplating on what to do and just really maybe they don't know what to do, right? I mean, we talked about forgiveness. We talked about uh, sins, consequences. We talked about uh, sins of the Father. Um, um, but now we're talking about actual salvation here. We're talking about actual ending it all and just starting over and, yep. and having a way out. You know, this is your lifeline, guys. This is your lifeline. So we're talking to all you guys and we're, we're giving you the invitation. Again, we don't like to end an episode without giving an invitation to everyone on how to get closer to God and how to start your life over and give you that opportunity to look up, to look up at this cross, the one that, that took the poison for you right. and, and for us to now be poisonless and not die from that poison that's been embedded in us whether it's through your father, whether it's through your own action, but whatever it is, we now have the way out. So Jim, um, I'm going to start us with a prayer, a okay. prayer of repentance, just so that we can we can end this show here and, and, and invite everyone for this. So Father God, we thank you for paying the price for our sins. We yes. believe your son, our King Jesus, who came to minister and essentially become the ransom and died on mm-hmm. our behalf to pay for our sins. Now we are set free and can be right standing with you so you can show us who you are the merciful, gracious, and a loving Father. Father, search our hearts, God. Give us a new heart. Help us walk with you to get to know you more each day. Thank you for loving us in a way that we experience the kind of love that only you can produce and provide. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And again, tune in for the next episode and talk to you guys later. Yeah. See you then. See you. Thank you for listening to Project Mankind. We hope that you enjoyed today's topic. To learn more about Project Mankind, make sure to follow us on social media at project underscore mankind. To be a guest or have any questions about any of our topics, you can email us at askprojectmankind at gmail.com. And before you go, make sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't ever miss a new episode. It's time to break free of those generational curses. Claim your freedom and use the authority God has given you and learn to lead like a lion and reign like our king.